The thing that makes us most prone really is that uh, we're very high achievers. So, you know, you, you have certain traits and characteristics. Um, of course, just being kind of type A, we often have uh, very high rates of addiction and substance use. So in general, as a whole, you know, class of physicians, uh, we, we are at much higher risk of opiate abuse. Um, alcoholism tends to be more specific to the specialty and things like that. So um, the highest rate of any addiction uh, of, of any field in medicine are female surgeons. Female surgeons are the highest risk. Um, anesthesiologists are, are higher. So a lot of the, the specialties uh, tend to be higher. Family medicine uh, tends to be lower. If you follow some of those things out, um, they, they do point towards the association, not, of course, being because anesthesia or surgery necessarily, you know, it, yes, the, you know, surgery can be very high stress, but in the research that I've done around this, and this includes researching around executives, different kinds of high stress environments, um, it's not necessarily the stressful environment that is causing addiction. It's that people tend to seek out high stress fields when they have a lot of the precursors that are the setup for addiction. Well, in a nutshell, um, up, an upbringing that is focused on results and achievements, uh, it might also include a lot of criticism, um, things like that. It could be outright abuse and trauma. So, you know, I do see physicians that have had, you know, terrible childhoods. Um, the public, I think, thinks that we had, you know, all these like amazing privileged <laughs> upbringings and, you know, we know <laughs> you study alongside people and that's just not the case. Um, you know, we know that that's, you know, we're, we're just regular people. A lot of us have gone through, you know, traumas, abuse, losses, um, you know, real hardships. More specifically, a few of the things that develop into the traits of addiction tend to be more around um, really focused on those results and things. So parents or an upbringing, just the culture around you, when it's more focused on grades than learning the actual subject, or you know, uh, you know, focused on prestige and what schools you're getting into, stuff like that. It might be that someone who becomes a doctor is focused on going to good schools and stuff, but what came before that was that to them, grades were like everything, um, instead of just finding science or bodies or the cells you know, fascinating. But for a lot of doctors, that's not really how they came to it. Yes, of course, the body's very interesting. I mean, I think, everybody's interested in, you know, science and the body. Um, so it's not that like, you know, a high achiever, you know, high pressure kind of doctor isn't interested in the body. So you can't let that confuse you. It's more that, well, how did you naturally come to it? And if it was, well, I wanted a high paying job. I want to raise a family. I want to be able to retire early. I want to, you know, have a prestigious job. I want to, you know, have a good reputation as like a, a you know, a good professional. Um, all those kinds of things, they're, they're fine, right? Those aren't like terrible motivations. Um, that's, I think, what drives most people to do what they wind up doing. But that's a different relationship to work than I'm just totally fascinated with the body and I had to become a doctor. The whole trophy kind of culture we have is, is equally awful. It's just a very, it's, a, it's another bad thing. It's, it's on the other end of it. And, and what that takes away psychologically is called self-efficacy. When, when we don't feel like, you know, say you're on the softball team and, you know, you got the trophy at the end and you're like, well, everyone got a trophy. And that, and that sounds nice, but we know, and research is really clear, um, the, the child does not develop self-efficacy, meaning that they don't get to learn, oh, wait, when I put work in and when I really pursue something and see it through, that that does something. Instead, it's just this cheapened result. And so like everyone's the same. And it's like, no, everyone's not the same, you know? And some people are better at other things. And, uh, and so we wanna know like when we really try hard at something that that can amount to some kind of achievement, right? So we don't wanna be pressured to achieve, we wanna be fostered to achieve. It's, it's a grown up, version of this you know we're all we're all lining up and you know playing and and you know we went through you know serious training camp 
uh, and then you're done. And then the other person, you know, went through something much quicker. Let's say gets, you know, 90% of the reimbursement. So you, you're, let's say you get a, a nine out of, you know, a nine tenth as big trophy or something. So it's, it's pretty indiscernible, right? It's, it's pretty much the same trophy. So you're sitting there like, I, man, I went through training camp. I did the spring training. I did, you know, the summer camp, like, and then the other one just, gets to show up and, you know, and gets the same thing. And it's, it's, it's about self-efficacy. You know, it, it, you can paint it pretty or ugly. You, you can cast it either as, well, it's this beautiful thing. There's room for everyone. We've, you know, we've got more patience to see. Why are we trying to be competitive? This isn't baseball. This isn't, you know, just, just, you know, everyone can get this, this privilege of treating patients. Um, but of course, you know, there's the dirty side, which is, you know, well, there's, there's patients' lives at risk and it's deceiving as well. Essentially, that's a, a grief process, right? You're, you're, you're mm-hmm. grieving like, this is not what I thought it would be. If you were going into medicine because of the, the lifestyle or the prestige of medicine, um, and remember, we're not counting that as a bad thing. It's a very good thing. You, it's, a, it's a noble profession and you're wanting to be an esteemed person in society. Well, then, you know, you realize you get here and it's, it's not probably what you think, you know? And so if you went into it with the relationship to the job being the job itself, rather than like you're saying, your relationship to it is, well, yeah, it's a job, or whatever, but um, can I see the patient please? You know, so that's a different relationship to your work. So the people who relate to it as just the profession, as long as they're understanding what they're struggling with and they enter treatment with that, it, it does amazingly. Um, but uh, the problem is I see a lot of people struggle and only understand the part where they're burnt out. Like that's the part that's really easy to see. You know, you're, you're working, you're burnt out. Um, but that's sort of like, to me, a symptom. You know, you can get burnt out for all kinds of reasons. Just like we know, you know, you can get a fever for all kinds of reasons. You can get burnt out because of home life or because of other, you know, other things going on, burnt out because you're seeing too many patients or too little pay or too little time off or whatever. Like there's, there's a lot of reasons you can get burnt out, um, all the charting. And, and, and that may not be a reflection of something, you know, going on truly, you know, underlying all of the stuff that's burning you out. So, um, so that's what I see getting missed, you know, as far as like what you're kind of asking is the treatments don't necessarily go well when they present, I'm, I'm burnt out, I need a therapist to talk this through with, and then you're just kind of sitting there figuring out, well, how can we create more time? Or have you told them, you know, that you need more time with patients or something? And typically, you know, we're, we're really smart, right? You know, doctors can usually work through those things and kind of figure that out. Does it help to sometimes have a little encouragement and accountability, you know, just taking a stand for ourselves? Sure. You know, that's not like wasted time, um, but that's not therapy. You know, that's just kind of coaching, you know, and, and I differentiate between those. I, I'll first say, I mean, a, a very talented, experienced, naturally gifted coach might be doing the same kinds of things an amazing therapist is doing. So. Um, that said, for the most part, yeah, I mean, a, a coach is going to have the kinds of trainings that a coach would have, right? The, you know, it's a lot of books and seminars and, you know, retreats and whatever. Whereas, yeah, you know, for me, you know, we, we can appreciate, you know, talking about the difference between doctors and other providers. Um, we can appreciate the difference, right? So, uh, you know, I, I think I'm speaking to a, a, an audience that immediately understands the training for a psychiatrist is, you know, on a very different level than for a coach. And so, um, so yeah, a coach would be very good if you're trying to navigate things that rest on logic or a logic, you know, so um, it's, you know, it's, I shouldn't say illogic, the, the logic side. So what am I going to, try and change about the practice? What am I going to try and change about the partnership or the ownership or the contract or my home life? And I'm going to try and work out more. All my Saturdays are off, blah, blah, blah. So 
coaches are very good at, you know, helping set boundaries and helping to kind of give a permission or accountability to things that make sense. And that's why there's a logic. Um, a psychiatrist uh, or a very good psychologist, um, they're going to be more attentive to uh, process based things and the parts that don't necessarily make sense. So why do I keep doing this when I know that it's bad for me? Now that's a, that's a psychiatric kind of, you know, question, or, you know, I know I need to do that, but I, 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 you know, can't leave when I know my patients still need help. Well, you know, yeah, you're a helper. We have to look at, you know, why can you know you need to set boundaries you know you need to leave work and get home to your family why aren't you doing that that's a psychiatric question um, and it might not be even that it's like you have full-on major depression or you know anxiety it's just that requires a little more depth of work that's going to really look at things about your childhood things about you know these processes that were programmed very early on um, and your relationship to people, to things, to like we were saying with work, uh, why do you need to help people? Uh, is it, you know, what, what's the idea there? Where are you running from? Um, so th those are more in the space of, you know, true therapy. Okay, so if we're narrowing into, you know, that kind of breach and, and now, you know, you're intimate or, or just making advances or something with a patient, you know, I, I don't just view that as, oh, wow, there's this instant chemistry. I mean, maybe there is. I mean, we're, we're humans, so there can, there can be chemistry, but um, we're also humans and, you know, not primitive animals. And so we, we, um, we usually want to see past, you know, just some instinctual idea. So, um, so yeah, you know, I, I view that as a, as a thing to tend to, not just, you know, oh, wow, that's a nice romantic connection. And whether married or not, I would still treat it. Um, I mean, there, there are different scenarios, of course, but I would still treat that as you know a, a real issue. And um, there's a lot of paths that can lead to that. Um, one of the most common for a doctor to do that would be that um, it might be revealing that uh, that doctor is um, very driven to to be well received and well liked, and so. Um, in a, in a weird way then, you know, to, uh, yes, it's taking advantage of a prestigious position. So, you know, there is that dynamic, you're really an authority and you're someone that person is looking up to. And so you have answers, you're, you're, um, you know, you're, you're the person that might be filling in what that person's always been seeking, right? So, uh, it's, it's usually not just one way, you know, usually they can kind of smell when that patient is all too susceptible, you know, very uh, smitten with someone with power who's, you know, willing to give them attention too. And so, um, so when someone can, you know, give in very easily to that, um, you know, that, that would be revealing of something you'd want to discover, you know, why you needed that. And um, yeah, for me, you know, I don't, make people feel stupid or, you know, punish people for that. Instead, um, you want to help them in a, you know, in a way that doesn't involve shame. Uh, try to discover, you know, what, why did I need that kind of attention? Why did I need to confirm that I could get that person? Um, so, you know, there's usually holes in that person's psyche, you know, their, their gaps growing up, you know, where they weren't getting something. Our, you know, we work so hard to get our degrees and keep our licensure, you know, always for doctors, I say, you know, just, just get on it, you know, don't, don't wait. If, if it's like the boundary issues you're talking about, if it's substances and drinking, um, of course, then that's riskier, please go even faster and, you know, to try and figure that out. Um, if it's softer things, that's when people usually do take too long or never go get help. But, um, you know, whether you do have something that, that you're really worried is going to become, you know, a licensing issue, um, you know, in like a board review or not, right? And that's just that, you know, you're, you're getting burnt out and life is just getting increasingly hard. Remember, physicians have, you know, huge rates of suicide. So um, we, we want to get ahead of that. that. That's what I hope, you know, for anyone in our field. It's a, it's a tough job, especially now with all the charting and then, 
we're getting squeezed from every direction. So um, whether you have like a troubled childhood or you were doing fine and now just getting squeezed in, in the you know, corporate medicine, um, just, just get in sooner than later. And, uh, you know, I, I liken good therapy to like physical therapy. I, I entered physical therapy because I had a bad hip. Um, at this point now, I'm just enjoying always figuring out new things to do for my body that have nothing to do with my hip. And so um, that's what I hope for people is you don't just wait and go in for the hip. Don't wait and go in for depression or, you know, someone caught you driving drunk. Go in just because you want to make life better. And that's that then is bringing some joy to it. It's so much more fun to sit down in therapy and figure out like <laughs> my mom did this, my dad did this. And why am I different than my brother? And why? Oh, gosh, I'm doing that with my kids. And why don't I do anything I like anymore? Like, it's fun to figure that stuff out. It it's is. not. Yeah, if you want to be really safe, what, you know, shouldn't ever really be a, a legal concern or, you know, opening yourself up to some kind of liability there um, is to seek treatment out, um, out of pocket. So, you know, not going through insurance. Once it's through insurance, it's recorded, right? And, and we all know that's, maybe, maybe not ever really safe from anybody else being able to discover. Um, so if you can go in sooner, get treatment that is out of pocket and that doesn't require then any diagnostic codes um, or anything like that, then uh, it's off the radar, so to speak. And, and it also allows you then if you're ever questioned, you know, on a renewal or a board review or anything like, did you ever need treatment for, you know, something that was impairing your practice? Um, you, you can say no, if it's because you were trying to figure yourself out, that might be hard to answer. And you could get nailed one day if it's, you know, if it's because you were driving drunk and, you know, you were court ordered for it or something. So, you know, going in sooner, keeping it fun. And, and if you've got, you know, the finances to doing it, you know, out of pocket, so it's not getting run through insurance, um, that's safe, right? I mean, you, and then you can honestly answer that question that you were never getting treated for anything, you know, that where you were impaired in your. Yeah, what the program does is, you know, walk you through all the things that you'd want to do to, to do the real um, depth of the work to deal with it. It's, it's not just superficial around, you know, don't drink or don't do drugs. It's, it's going to help people, you know, discover a lot. And the physicians really like that because they get to go through that deep work um, without, it's a, you know, technically it's, it's, it's a course or product, right? It's not, it's, it is absolutely not a medical treatment. And I like that it's not, I'm not trying to call it treatment or reach that stature. I, it's a, it's just something someone can go find and do. And, uh, and so that, yeah, they're, they're not liable at all for, you know, that that exposes them there. There's, there's no trail or connection, you know, to their medical care with it. And, well, and I like it.